Sounds great. Well, thank you all for joining us here today. And we're talking about spring being here and time to reconnect with mother nature. I was telling Joan, I thought it was so funny that, oh, and thanks Jason, that you're joining us from Bloomington, Illinois. Ah. Yeah, I was gonna say, Joan's pretty excited about that <laughs> with those Illinois connections. So I was just, I was, I was just gonna say that as, as you entered the Zoom um, waiting room, I think it said time to reconnect with mother. Um, that it just sort of stopped with mother nature. And I just thought that that was kind of comical. So, but we really wanted to talk today about how senior living communities can really enhance their outdoor spaces to make them a welcoming place, not just for residents, but for family members and staff members too. And I'm so happy that we're joined with um, here today with Maggie Calkins who's the uh, who's on the board of the Ideas Institute and Matt Richardson, who is the owner of Whisper Glide Spring Swing Company. And we are so pleased, Matt, that you are sponsoring our session today and that you also participated in, and sponsored the podcast that we held as well. If you haven't listened to the podcast, please do that. It's on the Listen, Learn, Explore event page on our website. And it really is a great podcast, but really this part of the explore is for all of us to delve deeper into this topic. And so this is meant to be a conversation. We are a small group, so please participate, um, add your comments and you can just unmute yourself, raise your hand, whatever you wanna do. And we would love to hear from you during this conversation. But we thought we would start off with a question for all of you. Um, and it's pertinent whether you work in a senior living community or you visit as a consultant um, to a senior living community or just visit senior living communities. But we love to know what is your favorite outside place in the senior living community you work in or visit? And I'll start with mine. And it's a place where... I love this outdoor space, but my issue with is I seldom see people using it. I'm a huge fan of rocking chairs. And so there's a senior living community near my house. Um, it is independent living and assisted living and memory care. And they have this lovely wraparound porch. And I'm a huge fan of wraparound porches too. And they have these wonderful rocking chairs. And I will tell you as a former ombudsman, when I would visit, I would talk with residents and we would go outside on this porch and just sit in the rocking chairs and talk. And that was just my favorite place to hang out to be. So we'd love to hear from you. What are your, what are some of your favorite outdoor spaces? And bless you, Maggie. Thank you. <laughs> Got it turned off just in time. <laughs> oh, can I show a picture of mine? Oh, sure. We'd love that. I, I just happened. This is not a community. This is a community I visited. Um, Hi. You can see that right now. Ooh. This was in, this is in Park Springs in Georgia. And this is in the courtyard of, uh, of one of their, of, of one of their neighborhoods. And the residents can go out and they can just wiggle their toes in the sand. And I just thought this was such a cool idea that obviously I took a picture and I shared it with lots of people. <laughs> that is a cool space. I love that, Joan. Okay, now I just stop my share here. Very cool. Okay, anybody else? What are some of your favorite outdoor spaces in senior living communities that you have visited or work in or live in? Hi, Verna. Hi. <laughs> We've got a great courtyard, has a, just a little water element with a little bridge and a little gazebo and nice uh, landscaping, fir trees and deciduous. And it's just a beautiful, sunny place to go out. It really is. I find water features are very, very helpful. That's cool. One of my sort of current favorite outdoor courtyard spaces is in Cypress Cove in Florida. Uh, and it's a memory care program. And there are a couple of things about it that I think are just so well done. Um, and this is covered in both the publication and the podcast, but it's a, the building is a two-story building and they 
just didn't have the land to be able to put everybody on the first ground floor to be able to have direct access outside. And so they added an elevator that is dedicated just to bringing residents that are living on the second floor down to the first floor, right into the outside garden space. Oh. So it, you know, it, it doesn't go anywhere else and it just opens up that outdoor space to the second floor residents in particular. First mm -hmm. floor can just open the door and go out. Um, and there are just so many wonderful elephant, elephants, <laughs> elements, <laughs> sorry. Um, I haven't been talking very much today, <laughs> elements. Um, and one of them is a water feature with pop jets. And pop jets are, I mean, you see them in some, uh, you know, big shopping centers or out, outside pavilions. And it's where the water, you know, sort of dances. Mm. It shoots and it dances. And this is very small. It's six or seven um, sort of little cement discs, a little bigger than a dining plate. Um, and the water pops up <clears throat> on a random schedule. And sometimes it's just a little couple of drops. And sometimes it's one of the shoots of water. And it makes such a great sound when it comes back down and, you know, hits the base that it's on. And I mean, when I have been there to visit, all I want to do is to pull up a chair and sit there mm. and watch it and listen to it and they say you know there are several residents that just do that they just want to spend outside time watching this fun fountain um and you know it adds a bit of whimsy and the kids love it and so you know that kind of an element i think is is lots of fun yeah i like that very cool Jason or Nicolette, Karen, Joanne? So this is Karen. We're a small community in a small town. Uh, we have 24 apartments and we're assisted living. We have a front porch that we extended oh, about a year or so ago and put a, um, a pergola, attached a pergola to it. Residents absolutely love, love, love being on the front porch. We're street facing, so um, I get regular updates on what the neighbors are doing from them, which is absolutely <laughs> awesome. And uh, we have every spring, the uh, a Girl Scout, the local Girl Scout troop comes in. We have um, wine barrel planters that, we pl that we've painted red, white, and blue. The Girl Scouts come and plant every year. And so we have a nice little party with them. And even last year, while we were with um, in the middle of COVID, um, the Girl Scouts were able to do it by, we separated the barrels out um, so that there was social distancing amongst the Girl Scouts, amongst our residents, and we were still able to enjoy lemonade and cookies with them, and they sang some of their songs, and so um, even in our small community, we tried to take advantage of that, and then just taking our residents for drives out through the farming community. They like to reconnect with the land and, you know, get up towards, um, towards Yellowstone on drives, and you know, it's nice living in this type of environment because they can still take advantage of what they're most familiar with, and that's the farming community, but also um, be able to, to celebrate with our own um, outdoor living space too. Oh, that sounds awesome. I love, Karen, too, how you were describing that, you know, the the residents tell you what the neighbors are doing, you know? Um, I think that that, that that just shows community. And like you said, and especially in a small town, that's awesome. I think we lost Maggie too. We'll look for her to have her come back in. Joanne, Nicolette, Jason, anything that you wanna to add to this conversation? Um, yeah, it's Joanne. Uh, I wanted to say, I mean, um, out here in Toronto, our weather is very unpredictable, uh, <laughs> as you probably know, up north. And uh, so, but we do have quite a few of our communities that have vegetable gardens and, uh, you know, uh, growing fruit trees, uh, not just out in the community, uh, out in the farm areas or further north, but also in the downtown core, we have very little space, but we make the most of that space. Um, and a lot of those vegetables and fruits go into the daily meals um, for our residents. So those that are able to 
to partake in that, they definitely enjoy that the fresh fruit and fresh produce. Um, and you know, the, the, just the pride in, um, in growing uh, fresh fruits and vegetables, you know, makes it a lot more uh, homey. It gives that, uh, you know, home-like environment and they're able to share that with the residents and the staff as well, so. Oh, very cool, very cool. Nicolette, it looked like you were gonna share too. Um, behind one of our, I don't work in the care home. I am a facilitator for a memory cafe here in Farmington, uh, cool. but I visited some of the local homes and behind one of the assisted living homes, they have turkeys. And I mean, like literally just like across the driveway. And so people um, that live there, the workers can look at the turkeys um, whenever turkeys, I guess, come out. Um, but that's something they're very, um, they're very proud of at that assisted living home is the view of the turkeys. That's awesome, I love that. <laughs> I went to a place once where the administrator gave us a tour and we were doing a day of observations. And as he walked through this one activity space that looked out onto a courtyard, he said, oh yeah, and we've got a couple of chickens in there. The residents love the chickens. <laughs> and so as we were doing our observations, the person I was with and I kept sort of going over to the window and looking out and we just didn't see them. And finally, mid afternoon, one of the residents said, you keep going over that window, what you looking for? I said, well, we were sort of looking for the chickens that the administrator told us about. And they said, oh, we got rid of them long ago. They made too much noise in the morning and he didn't want to hear about it. So we just never told him. <laughs> <laughs> he still thinks they have chickens, but the residents didn't like how much noise they made in the morning. They must have had a couple of uh, roosters. Rooster. <laughs> I don't even want to know how they got rid of them, though. <laughs> I probably found a local farm. I'm sure they did. I'm sure they did. <laughs> well, Matt, I want to give you the opportunity. You know, with Whisper Glide, you've been to, you know, just a number of communities. And, and do you have a favorite? a favorite space that, that one of the communities that you've visited used? Um, nothing that really stands out. I, I, I think the, the key is, is the more diversion you can have in your outdoor space, the more attractive it is going to be to the population of the, um, of the community. And, uh, you know, the, the water feature that uh, Maggie was talking about, I think that's a great idea because people love that. Uh, and, and the gardening, uh, obviously with our product, with the, the, the gliders, the, you know, the, and the rocking motion, that gives them another element. I see. So I think it's, the key is, is to get as much diversity in your outdoor space to attract not only the residents, but also getting families excited about taking their, when they come for a visit. And it, I think it helps with that buy-in. Um, mm -hmm in selling, uh, in, in promoting the outdoors, if, if you can get something that resonates with the residents and obviously also with the family members to get them out there. So, um, and, 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 and no one knows what those are going to be that will resonate with uh, the respective members. But um, I just think it's, it's a, just a good idea to have variety in whatever you do. I think it's a great point, and it's a great segue, Maggie, into all the work you've done about helping communities design outdoor spaces. And I think what Matt said about, you know, variety and having different things that are going to engage people, you know, visually and, you know, and what the, and, you know, what they hear and just all different things. So do you want to talk a little bit about that? Well, and I like some of the things that I heard that are really specific to the residents in your community. I mean, you know, going out and driving through the countryside because that's what these people used to do when they were home, those evening drives is, you know, really tying into what's important to them. Um, so, so I really, you know, that's one of the cores of person-centered care is, you know, know the resident and talking with them about what's important to them. Um, and, you know, people who have lived in more urban areas may not have done a lot of gardening. 
but people who have lived in rural areas typically have done a lot. So again, another community, this was one that I visited when I was doing my dissertation um, and I was looking at memory care living areas. They only had, it was a rural community, but they only had a relatively small courtyard for the memory care program. And so they would put in, you know, a small patch of beans and one tomato plant and, you know, one something else, no squash or anything that was big and viney. Um, but then when the time came and all of the different crops were coming, coming ripe, the staff who all had big gardens at their houses would bring in their extra produce and sort of go out and hide it in the garden so that the residents would go out and get this bountiful amount <laughs> of tomatoes, way more than what you would get off of one plant. <laughs> but, but, you know, it tied into their memories. And then they, you know, used all of that produce in cooking projects in the memory care area. Um, you know, this was, a, this was a long time ago when I did my dissertation. So they didn't have a big kitchen, but they did do cooking activities. And so they would have the residents, you know, chop the tomatoes and snap the beans, you know, and do all of that. Um, so the residents really felt like you know, they had put in this garden and they had tended it. And then they had this bountiful harvest um, that they could then use. Um, and so that kind of an approach, I, I think can work really well. And, and recognizing that even with people who have memory loss, memory impairment, um, it doesn't mean that every activity has to be just really short and one and done. That you can keep these things going over time because they are so deeply tied into their long-term sort of adult experiences. Um, I loved the image that, I forget who showed it, of the sandbox, the chairs with the sand. You know, I, I, we have a summer cottage in Michigan and I instantly wanted to just take my shoes off and, you know, dig my feet into my carpet under my chair and, you know, pretend that it was sand. Um, so there are some visceral positive experiences. For some, it's grass. For some, it's sand. For some, it's the motion. It's the swinging. And that's why the Whisper Glide, um, you know, products are so great because that kinetic motion uh, is actually very helpful. There's been some research that shows that when people are rocking back and forth or moving forward and back, it forces them to be working on their vestibular systems and their balance. Um, and so it's actually very healthy for them to be rocking or gliding back and forth. Um, and again, it provides a diversity of different kinds of experiences at the garden that I was talking about at Cypress Cove that has the pop jets. This is Florida. They have a rainy season. Um, and often it's sort of not big storms. I mean, they do get hurricanes and things, but often it's just a sort of gentle rain that comes down. And so again, one of the things they did was to create this great rain chain so that as the rain comes down and it comes down into all of these little sort of brass cups, um, it, it tinkles, it, it makes noise. And they put it right next to a deep covered porch area that has some chairs. So in a gentle rain, you know, you can go and sit outside and listen to both the raindrops coming down and the rain chain making its music. Hmm. And so those multi-sensory things are also really appealing. Um, I think one of the things that communities sometimes do is they focus just on the visual aspect of the garden and think about people sort of sitting there and looking at it. You know, it doesn't change a whole lot. Flowers take a long time to open up. And, you know, if you aren't thinking about planting for 
songbirds or for the butterflies um, that, that bring a little more animation to the visual part of the environment, it, it can be sort of boring to sit outside. I mean, it's nice, you're in the sunshine, you're getting the fresh air, but if you're looking for something a little more interesting, you've got to plan it so that there are things that are happening. Um, and whether it's with an animal, chickens, ducks, whatever you want, um, or uh, in, again, in one memory care program, um, they had some little ceramic rabbits um, that, you know, were sort of little, little statuettes that are about six inches tall. Um, and you know, every morning or every evening, one of the staff would go out and move the statues around in the garden so that the next day there were, you know, not all of them, but there were a couple of residents who just always wanted to know where the rabbits were. And so they would go and spend time, you know, right after breakfast looking for the rabbits and, you know, looking under the big leaves at, you know, and it was a way of being really actively engaged. And I think it's that active engagement that a lot of communities aren't as good at. And that's why they feel like they've put all this money into this pretty outside space and nobody goes and uses it. And so see, it's not worth it. Um, and it, it sort of perpetuates that idea that, you know, nobody really wants to be spending time outside. Um, and I think if you, if you think about what it is that will engage the residents, and it's going to be different, um, you really can make them spaces that people want to get outside. And then the other half of it is you have to make it easy for people to get outside. Um, you know, there are a lot of places where you don't have direct access from the living area, or there's a door, but it's not very visible, or you've got direct access, but it's not visible from inside. And so the staff aren't comfortable with residents being outside if they can't see them. Again, particularly if we're talking about a memory care program, um, you know, the staff are worried for their safety. It's, it's all in the, uh, you know, under the umbrella of we want to keep our people safe. Um, but sometimes in doing that, we create an environment that is too safe and not sufficiently interesting. Um, and so, you know, some of that has to do with the design of the whole building. Some of it has to do with the presence or absence of technology. Um, you know, if, if you've got an outside space that just isn't visible, it's so easy to put a, a camera these days, you know, all these ring doorbells and things that are motion centered it's oh, a couple of hundred dollars and you put the receiver somewhere where the staff are spending time um, or where there is a staff person who is often spending time who can just sort of keep their eye on what's going on outside. So there are lots of, of other solutions if your design isn't ideal um, to, you know, to work around it. So have any of you run across any of those either challenges or other creative ideas for things that the residents seem to really like doing outside? Um, I'd like to bring up the idea of how outdoor spaces often create rituals, yearly rituals. Uh, for example, our organic gardeners close up the garden and they have a har they harvest and have a meal together and celebrate that year. And that's a really sweet thing. Mm -hmm. um, and they make up recipes and things with uh, what they have. And I, they do a great job. It's, I've grown very spoiled having fresh herbs for cooking now. It's just wonderful. The other thing is we have a, a little pond with fountain. And every year we wait for a duck couple to come in. And inevitably we'll have some little ducklings and things. So, um, you know, it creates an emotional almost cycle that's really, really nice. Yeah, I, th I think that's a really good point um, because, you know, every year is a cycle and honoring that cycle with, you know, the first of 
a spring thing and the end of the garden. Right. Um, and, it, and it can even be on a daily basis, having a flagpole where the residents go out and raise the flag mm -hmm. every day and take it down. And if, you know, something unfortunate has happened, you talk about just having it at half mast. Um, and it gives, you know, it then feeds into other conversations that you could be having inside or outside. But, but again, it, it's an activity that sort of demands that people go outside. Um, and, and I think that's, that's important. I, I like that ritual part. Maggie, I think when you were talking, it made me think um, quite a number of years ago, I, I can't even remember, <coughs> excuse me, where the community was. It was in one of the Carolinas, I think. And it was a small house community um, in, a, in a nice climate. And so, and then your community center was also on the ground. So one of the things that struck me when we walked into the first of the small houses was right by the door was an umbrella tree uh, and a coat tree. And it was, it was stocked with umbrellas, there were raincoats, there were all kinds of different things. And one of the things that the staff shared was, you know, because of the way we are, because of where our community center is located, residents have to go out sometimes when the weather is not the greatest. And yet we have this, 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 you know, surplus safety mindset sometimes that heaven forbid, if the temperature is not perfect, if it's too hot, if it's too cold, if it's too wet, if it's too dry, then we can't go out. And that leaves what, maybe, you know, two days a year that you can <laughs> actually go outside. So have you seen that in communities and, and people being willing to, you know, go out no matter. We no, all walk in the rain. Yes, and you know, and there'll be a lot of communities that will have one or two people who want to go out regardless. Um, the first community that I worked in full time uh, is in Cleveland, Northeast Ohio, and uh, we had a resident male who didn't do activities. You know, he was not social. He'd lived alone a long time. He didn't like to do group activities, didn't really like to share his table with anybody. Um, and what he liked to do was to be outside. And so even in the middle of winter, you know, he would put on his coat and his hat and his muffler scarf and, you know, come out and the staff would make sure he had everything and say, oh, you need your gloves. So he'd go get his gloves and then they would go and let him outside. Even when there was two feet of snow out, there was a place where there was a table that was under an overhang and he could sit there for hours and it was where the staff would take a break. So, you know, the staff would sort of check in with each other and say, John's still outside, who needs to take their break? Uh, and they'd say, okay, I'll go get my coat and take my break outside. Um, and they'd go and sit with him for a while. Um, so it, it, it can happen regardless of the weather. Um, having those props right there by the door, again, makes it easy. Raincoat, umbrellas, um, sunglasses. Uh, Creekview at Evergreen has a plastic bin by every door that goes into a courtyard where they have different kinds of sunglasses, including ones that will go over your regular glasses um, to make it easy. So that if you're sort of standing there and you're looking outside and you're thinking, oh, it might be nice to go outside, but it looks really bright. And I don't really have the energy to go back to my room and get my glasses and come on back and, you know, um, they're right there and you could just use them right there. And, you know, they buy them by the hundred box and they're not very expensive. And if people take them into their rooms or families take them home or whatever, it, you know, it's not a great expense. Um, and Joan, I see that you had asked about children's playgrounds. Um, I, you, you do see it in some communities and then you'll hear in other communities where they really don't want one because they don't want the neighborhood kids coming and playing on it at all hours, you know, when they're trying to go to bed at eight or 8.30. Um, and so, um, you know, it, it does happen, but it has to be thought out. And it's the kind of thing that you wanna be asking your residents and the families about. Um, do, do they want that? Uh, again, at Creekview at Evergreen, um, they have a nice playground area, but it's actually inside 
in one of the buildings in a junction between a couple of different households which again in wisconsin means that the kids can play on it in the middle of winter mm -hmm. um which they might be less likely to do if the playground were outside um I, so would just, I just wanted to say maggie i was i was consulting in a community that had a playground um it's a ccrc an older ccrc um and they had the, the, the way the architecture of the community was, the apartments where folks who were in the independent living section lived was kind of like a horseshoe. And so the playground was there. And then there were other apartments that faced the road. And so people had the option of whether they wanted to have the playground side, and that's what they called it, or the road side. And they decided to open it up. They, they were in a neighborhood. Um, on the top of a hill, they opened it up to the community. And this was a resident decision. The residents loved having people, you know, come in and use the playground and things like that. And but this this home, this was was really part of the community as well. It was all integrated. So it made so much sense. But what it also meant is that became the gathering place for staff members. Staff members would actually come on a Saturday when they weren't working and bring their kids to play on the playground you know it was just it was just that community feel and i even feel my body language changing because it was just so warm and comforting to have that and they also offered i have to say the sunglasses at the door in so many of the exits out to their um outdoor areas and also hats they offer different types of hats, both for men and women, because, you know, I'm in Denver. And so sun is an issue here is sometimes, you know, a good issue, but, you know, they, they couldn't have the sunscreen out, um, but, the, but they did have hats and sunglasses available. Well, and the other thing that that does is that it, it, it helps, I mean, it, it may have been sort of natural for that community, but it, it helps break down that sort of separation between the the old folks home uh and the rest of the community and when you create a resource that your surrounding neighborhood wants to come and use and you do it with the intent of of encouraging that kind of integration that's just a win-win for everybody and whether it's a playground or in milwaukee one of the jewish homes had an outpost of the favorite Jewish deli there. Mm. And, and so not only did the residents go down and you know get deli sandwiches, um, people who worked in the area would go over there for lunch. And so you know, the residents learned you know, not to go between 10 of 12 and 1245, because there were too many outsiders there <laughs> you know, coming and getting lunch. Um, but but it, it breaks down those barriers. And that's another great thing to be able to do. And the outside is a wonderful resource to use to do that with. Um, That's so what, I, I yeah, love that so, story. It's so cool too. I, I will tell you, I thought of this and I, I hadn't thought of it until you said it, it broke down barriers. So many of their dietary assistants were high school kids that actually could walk to work. <laughs> they walked to the job and, and the reason they, they knew that those jobs were available was because of this integration. So yeah, it really played out in all different ways, but interesting, it was because of, you know, truly that outdoor space that, that helped them create community, so. Right, yeah, it can be a great catalyst for all sorts of things. This is Karen at the Heartland. Um, in, in Pal, our, our weather up here is very volatile. So, I mean, we, we have snow 12 months out of the year, yeah. even on the 4th of July. So we truly enjoy the outdoors when it's very nice. Um, even if it gets to 45, we have folks that want to go outside. But to combat that, we bring the outdoors inside. Mm -hmm. So we do, um, I, I was kind of giggling to myself, the chairs with the sand, because we've had days where we fill um, kiddie pools with sand and we have a day at the beach. So everybody is like, okay, come on, we're going to, Put on our shades we're going to put on our straw hats and um the the residents really enjoy celebrating these days in fact we were just working on our calendar for may and may ray day is next month and that's a day where you purposefully go outside 
So we're planning on having a picnic. And if it doesn't pan out, if it's cold and snowy that day, then we'll have our picnic indoors. And we actually have props that we, we have. We have built trees and um, we even have little um, plastic ants to put on the table oh, that, to on. celebrate the picnic with. But <laughs> it's bringing the outdoors. And, and we've tried, we actually were so blessed with receiving some COVID funding. So we were able to build uh, a visitation area. We call it our cozy corner, but we made sure it has natural, lots of natural light coming in and we have um, have plants and things in there. So whether it's cold outside, we still have warmth inside and can bring that outdoor living inside so that we can truly celebrate our outdoor life 12 months out of the year. That's wonderful. That's, you know, that's very creative and um, you know, there are lots of ways of bringing the outside in, and I loved your examples. Um, you know, picnics inside, there's no reason why you can't have a picnic inside. Um, and sure, the ants ought to be there as well. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Matt, that makes me think, don't you have a swing too that you actually design so that it goes inside, like you can go outside and inside? It actually is, uh, yeah, it's, it's designed so it can be easily moved from indoors to outdoors. And, um, and, it, and it's a freestanding, it's got its own platform so you don't have to mount it to any floor, uh, whether it be indoors or outdoors. And it, it, the whole process takes about 20 minutes to do. And it gets you that, you know, the, the gliding motion, whether you're indoors, outdoors. And to, to Karen's example, you could literally put that indoors in their out into their, it sounds like it's almost like an atrium that they have that you could give it an outdoor feel uh, that you're swinging uh, in an outdoor setting, but yet be indoors. Yeah, I think it's just a great example, Karen. Thanks for, for sharing that of, of bringing the outdoors in because I think that that's important too. Yeah, and it, it can go beyond sort of just the the greenhouse space, um, you know, greenhouse is lovely, um, but but there are so many more ways of bringing the essence of the outside in. Someone else was going to say something. I will. When we were uh, talking about playgrounds, I was thinking about the the care communities I've been to. There aren't a lot of them, but that have daycare for children, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, for the workers and for others in the community. And they tend to have, you know, the playground for the kids and the residents just love, like we all do, watching the kids play on the playground. Uh, but they also do a lot of intergenerational programs, you know, which is wonderful too. Right. Yeah. I'm increasingly seeing particularly sort of larger retirement communities um, creating a larger sort of community garden space with the specific intent of growing to be able to give the produce to a local farmer's market or a food bank um, or, you know, to do something good and return benefit, you know, back to their local community. Um, and, and again, people like to know that they're having a positive impact. They want to contribute to their, to their world. And, um, you know, when you move into a retirement community, many of those, not all, but many of those opportunities are either taken away or made, made much more difficult. Um, and so, you know, really focusing on what are the kinds of things that community residents can do that gives back? Um, and increasingly, I'm seeing uh, places that are using outside spaces um, to, to do that. Uh, so I, I applaud those activities as well. Maggie, that makes me think of, you know, when I, and I am of retirement age, so I could be looking this direction. You know, when I think about what I want, I, I want to be able to go out and walk. I want to be able to walk, not just 
and a concrete jungle. I want to be able to walk someplace that is is aesthetically what I want it to be. I want to be able to ride my bike. I want to be able to do those kind of things. And you're seeing more and more just communities at large just that are, are incorporating that into their towns that are you're bringing that and and to bring that into the to the CCRC setting or the or the you know the residential care settings I worked for one or I worked for an organization that had a community that I had worked there for probably five or six years and never knew that they had this beautiful wood they had a lot of property they had a beautiful wooded area that had paths going all through it. And nobody even knew it was there. They never talked about it. They never advocated using it. They never, until finally they once uh, somebody new came in and they decided to have a 5K to as a fundraiser for their community. So they brought in the outside community to utilize this beautiful space that nobody had ever really thought about how could our residents use it? How could it be accessible to someone maybe in a wheelchair or, you know, and I think we, I think there's probably opportunities out there that are lost. Yeah, yeah. Um, missed opportunities are common and, and I think more common with outside spaces and amenities um, because people don't think about it first. Um, and yet when you do, you can be very creative about using space, creating, you know, nice, interesting outside spaces, almost regardless of where you are. And if you've got an amenity like, you know, some woods behind the property, um, not leaving it just as woods, but creating the trails uh, so that the people can go back and use it and having different lengths of trails. So, you know, it's not just one long loop that is two miles that you have to do the whole thing. You want to design it so that somebody can do a half a mile loop, a one mile loop, you know, that, that, that they can have that kind of flexibility without having it be a half a mile loop that you're doing four times. Um, like where I walk my dog sometimes. <laughs> and it gets boring. Um, so, uh, Matt and Maggie, I have a question for both of you. Um, since since you're dealing with communities all over the country and working with them, you know, specifically in their outdoor spaces, do you see things changing? Do you see things changing that communities are investing more, not just in how their outdoor spaces look, but in ensuring that their spaces that people have access to and want to be in. Do you see a change? Um, not as great as I would like to see. Uh, I think there are getting to be more really good examples and the evidence about the benefits of spending time outside is growing and I think is becoming more widely known. Um, I mean, it's, it's one of the most effective treatments for depression is getting that natural sunlight during the day. Um, and uh, so I think there's a, a beginning shift to spending more time thinking about the outside spaces and creative administrators or you know communities that have that have some really creative people are doing it but there are i mean there are still a lot and i still see you know new ones that are designed to look pretty um, you know so often the sort of the visual aspects of the community are designed for the first impressions for potential residents and families. And it's that marketing department that says, we need to make this pretty. That they're not really concerned with once the resident has moved in, what's going on and is anybody using this space? They're just interested in what the first impression is. Um, and so I would, like to see more communities get beyond that first impression 
Um, and it's why I was so delighted with the opportunity to work on the, the publication, the white paper, and do the podcast and you know do this. And we did a webinar last year um, to, to really spread the word and help people understand how important it is and you know, get some really creative ideas for how to create spaces that people want to spend time in, because that's the ultimate goal. Yeah, and and just you you mentioned the white paper. Just so everybody knows, I did put the link to the white paper in the chat too. Designing gardens to attract activity. Matt, do you have anything to add about what you're seeing? Well, I, I think you know with with the whole thing with the pandemic. And people, and it's very uh, unanimously agreed upon that spending out time outdoors is safer than visiting indoors. Um, and with so many of these residents not having been around their loved ones, I think in, in knowing that they can safely, it can be safely done, be done outdoors, I, I, I truly, what I'm seeing is, is there's been a lot of people who are forcing that issue of wanting to make the outdoors a more central focal point for especially for their outdoor or for their uh, fam, uh, family and friends to come visit them and I can just say from the number of inquiries I've gotten this year at this time of, of, of the calendar year compared to past years it's about fourfold uh, increase in the amount of interest in our products just because there's been such a renewed interest in um, the outdoor environment. Um, and, I, and I think families are pushing a lot of that to the administration saying, we wanna come visit and if it has to be outdoors, that's fine. But we wanna, they're, they're, I think they're, they're, they're a big factor behind that is, is the family pushing for, the, for these outdoor settings so they can come safely visit their, uh, their loved ones. Great. And you may be more on the cutting edge of that because I haven't been going to communities and doing any, you know, consulting for a year. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm, that's going to pick up again. But um, I'm glad to hear that, you know, there's an, an increased interest in making these outside spaces ones that are comfortable, that people really want to go out. And um, yes, particularly right now, that's really important. Yeah. We have to sustain that, you know, it's one of those things that, you know, it, it sounds like possibly came as a result of the pandemic. That's one of those things we need to keep, be consistent yes. and continue. Yeah, that keep going part of the new normal. Exactly, exactly. Well, there's there's a lot of pent up, pent up um, uh, demand, I, you can say, but I mean, there's a, there's a lot of people really wanted to, they, you know, they missed a whole year out of their their loved ones' lives, and, and it's time to play catch up. And uh, like I said, it's just um, what I've seen from my standpoint, my little universe, it's substantial in interest in the outdoors, substantial. No, I think that's a really, really good point. Nicolette, Karen, Jason, Verna, Kathy, everybody, wondered if, if you had any other questions for Matt and Maggie or things that you'd like them to discuss. I was wondering, you know, we talked about bringing the the outdoors indoors. What about moving a lot of the things that we do in care homes outside? Mm -hmm. Like, could there be more like art engagement outside um, or just things that normally we would just do inside? Could we move them outside? More people could engage. People could maybe spread out a little bit more. Yeah. Um, yeah, and absolutely. then just have that background, you know, ambiance of the outdoors. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, I, I've had a, a number of um, activity staff, you know, say to me, um, not it's not if you build it, they will come. It's if you bring food, they will come. <laughs> so, you know, anything with food outside. And if you have the space, it's it can be easier to expand and allow for that social distancing. Um, but you know, art classes or all sorts of different kinds of things can be done outside. Um, I mean, you know, even your chair exercise class, um, you can do it outside. 
and it's probably even healthier if you're doing it outside rather than inside. Um, so I think that's a great suggestion and, and just taking a look at, you know, the activity calendar. It, it can be hard to have movie time outside, um, hard to get a screen that, you know, works with, with the daylight. Um, but other than that, there are lots of things that really could be brought outside. I think one of the things that I've found is that we're only limited by, um, what is my, my thought for the day is don't let what can go wrong stop you from what can go right. Mm. And great, I yeah. think that mm -hmm. we're probably our own worst enemy. Last summer, I mean, we, we're pretty innovative here. We don't have a lot of money uh, and we want to make sure our residents um, are, tr you know, that we're looking at the, the holistic approach with our residents. And so we bought a couple of canopies and we just put them in our parking lot. We would roll our tables out and we'd have picnics outside because we could socially distance on a nice day, but we still wanted to provide enough shade for all the residents. Well, we even had a couple of early on in the, in the um, pandemic shutdown, we actually didn't have a lot of, we didn't have any positivity in Wyoming until probably August. So in May and June, we actually had a socially distance yard sale. And so our residents were manning the tables. We put them in masks and we, you know, anyone that came up was socially distancing from them, but it gave them an opportunity to be outside and be doing stuff. And, you know, it was a nice little fundraiser for us. Uh, we rolled our easel outside and did um, Pictionary on the front porch. And so I think that if we don't limit ourselves, we're not limiting our residents. Yep, it's mindset. We all love that, Karen. You know, I saw Joan just do the thumbs up when you said that too, because I think you're right. I think we get into this when, when we think about doing something new, our first thought is, okay, what are the pitfalls? What do we have to watch out for? Instead of what are the fabulous benefits that could happen and how do we mitigate the other stuff? Yep. Verna, I'm interested from you and your community, this whole conversation about what other things you can do outside. And I know where you live, there's a lot of creativity and innovation going on. Anything to add to that conversation? One of the things I was just thinking about is um, when you do have limitations in space that um, just a, a small group in a van going to the botanic gardens, but I think understanding the restorative nature of nature and that you don't have to program an activity, just bring people to a park and let them sit and observe or have a quiet conversation that stillness that we need in our life. I think that's really important. It doesn't take a lot of planning or, or a lot of work, but it's really, really important. Uh, I think that's a great point. And Maggie, I know you just told all of us that, <laughs> that you have to get off soon. Congratulations. Sounds like you're doing a very exciting webinar at the top of the hour. It's, it's a busy day. I'm, I'm going nonstop today, so. Well, thank you for joining us. We so appreciate you being here, Maggie, you know, the authorship of the white paper, the podcast, and really, you know, this and your expertise on this topic. This has just been so helpful. And I know that, um, you know, you're always available to people to, you know, answer any questions as well. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Maggie. I'll put my email address in the chat. So if anybody wants to reach out to me. That would be awesome. You are just a wealth of information. So and thank I, you. Know, I love getting ideas from other people because that's how we all learn. It's the best way to learn. So exactly. I'm going to sign off. Okay. Thank you, bye bye. Thank Mike. you so much. So with our two minutes left, is there anything that anyone else has any questions about or any comments about? Thank you. This is important. It really is important. And people so often underestimate it and the value to health of our residents. I agree. And I'll tell you, it's one of my pet peeves. Matt knows this because we've had multiple conversations about this ever since Matt and I got to know each other. Um, and I heard about Whisper Glide. You know, I was I was just so interested in his ideas of, of how you create spaces.
to make them accessible for residents. And the fact that Whisper Glide have these swings available um, for people in wheelchairs too, Ooh. to be able to, yeah. So Matt, do you want to tell just briefly what, you know, sort of you specialize in? Uh, the wheelchair accessible swing is actually the, um, the most popular uh, one because it's the most unique one. It's the only one like it in North America where it allows you to actually have the wheelchair on the same platform and there's a bench seat on the opposite side. So everyone is together. Everyone is going through the same gliding motion together and they're facing one another to be able to have their, their uh, social interactions. And, and the, it's designed where the movement can be created either by the person in the wheelchair with the, these therapeutic handles, or it can be done by the people sitting in the bench seat. Um, and it has a very large canopy, oversized canopy on it to protect everyone from the sun. So, um, you know, you can't exclude those people in, the, in, in, the, in wheelchairs because they represent a large, significant uh, part of the population. And, uh, the, and, and they get so much enjoyment. And it's a shared activity that's mutually enjoyed by all, I, from grandkids all the way up. So, um, but yeah, that's my little short little spiel. So thank you, for Penny, for giving me the opportunity to say a few words. No, because I think it's so important because I think when we're talking about creating spaces that are accessible and accessible for all, that's what's so important, I think, about Whisper Glide and your swings. Um, and I will, I will share with everyone, Matt was generous enough and he was going to do it last year as well, but our in-person conference got canceled, that we raffled off one of his spring uh, swings at our annual conference a few years ago. Um, and it was a woman from a community in New York who basically won the spring, the swing, I want to say spring, swing for her community. And I can't even begin to tell you how excited she was that she could actually bring this swing to her community. Um, and I think that's what was so powerful. I, mean, I, I just, I can still picture her face, Matt, of how, of the excitement that she like had. Show, you know, uh, one of the game shows coming, coming down to win her, uh, win her prize. <laughs> <laughs> because this was so cool because I think that it is something that and I get the sense just from it's one of those things that once you try it you want it so yeah so thank you for that and thank you so much Matt for for your willingness to be a partner with Pioneer Network um we're so happy to have you and I think that what you're doing is so important too so so I want to respect everyone's time. Jason and Nicolette and Karen, thank you so much for joining us here. Verna, thank you for your participation here. I'm so glad that you joined. Jason, you're very welcome. Um, this is recorded. So if you want to review it or share it with anyone else, you will find it on the Listen, Learn, Explore site. And our next episode, Joan, is going to come out tomorrow, correct? Of Listen, Learn, Explore? Yeah. It is, and you're going to get to learn about pay for performance and some great work that is being done um, in that arena and, and a little bit about a toolkit for how to do it yourself, how to, how to get something started in your state. Well, great. Well, thank you. Well, again, thanks to everyone. We hope you have a great day and enjoy the outdoors. Everyone get outside today. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.